you who voted to elect Mary Moriarty as the Hennepin County Attorney with this focus on wanting to see a paradigm shift with regard to criminal justice and police accountability um, here in Hennepin County. So it's an honor to be here with you all. My name is Nakima Lee Armstrong, I'm a civil rights attorney and activist, resident of North Minneapolis, and also the founder of the Racial Justice Network. We partnered with the Community United Against Police Brutality um, to bring this forum to you tonight so that we can have an opportunity to hear directly from Mary about her office's priorities. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions that my team came up with um, to Mary, and then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A with you all so that you can ask Mary what you wanna know um, about what's happening in her office. I've been very thankful to see Mary's responsiveness when people from the community reach out to her and uh, request meetings and talking through various issues. That is something that we have not experienced um, over the last several decades um, through previous uh, county attorneys. And so it is refreshing to see, at a minimum, right, some responsiveness, but also uh, that Mary is setting out to accomplish. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'll ask Mary to provide any opening. Thank you guys again for being here tonight. Finding out there really was no process. And so we put in a lot of work. We have an amazing team, some of whom are here tonight. Um, but they put in a lot of work to put in place processes uh, to make the system fairer. And the legislature last session gave us a lot of new tools um, that we are implementing and we're excited about. So I uh, want to cut this short and get to questions um, because I'm really excited to talk about what we're doing and to hear what your questions are as well. Awesome. So what I'm going to ask folks to do, if you will, is to go on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, go to the Listen Media USA page and share the live stream for those who could not um, make it tonight so that they can watch um, what is happening. So if you guys can take a moment and share it, encourage people to watch, I would appreciate it. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. My first question is, what were your first year priorities and how have you made progress on them? We, it, it's funny to say we have a lot of priorities, um, but as I said, one of the big ones, uh, we have over we're about 500 employees, 500 staff, and we have many different divisions. Most of most people think of us as doing prosecution, right? But we have child support, we have mental health, we have child protection. And each of those divisions plays a different role and important roles, like child protection, taking kids away from their families. And so we have to spend some time trying to figure out what exactly are the processes in this office and who handles what. Um, we took several months to develop a new strategic plan, a new vision and mission statement that we'd be happy to provide. We spent a lot of time on that. Uh, Brady was a big issue. Uh, staffing was a big issue. We've been able to hire over 100 new staff. Um, and what we look for with staff are people who are values aligned um, and interested in doing the work uh, as we see it. In other words, really some of the things based on data and really trying to examine what works um, and what doesn't work. And that's been a big focus. Um, we, we've done so many different things. Uh, sometimes it's, but first of all, let me say, I completely changed the org chart. The office traditionally has had two deputies, civil and criminal. And it's very, was very hierarchical. 
So everything kind of started down here and went up. I changed the org chart uh, to flatten out. We, we do have two deputies, but they are on the same line as the rest of our directors. We are fortunate to steal away Jen White, who's in the front row there. Uh, Ooh, and Jen. now, shout out to Jen. I looked at the org chart and I found 1.5 FTEs for community engagement in the entire office. And that was buried in child support, I think. And so what I did, what we did, was elevate community engagement, community affairs to a director level position. And that's, we were fortunate to hire Jen and Wayne to do that. We also created a brand new professional standards division. The office had never had that. And that houses our training. The office really had no training before. It houses um, what will be our conviction integrity unit. Uh, prosecutor initiated uh, sentencing adjustment, uh, Brady, all of those things. So we created two divisions that had never existed before. Uh, so those are just several of the things that we've done. What about diversity within your office as you guys have increased your hiring? Yes. It's it, diversity. So, so one of the things Ironically, as you know, I was chief public defender for a while. I spent a lot of my time arguing for salary parity for public defenders with the county attorney's office. Last session, the legislature uh, gave a bunch of money to the public defender's office, and now they make a lot more than our staff. Wow. <laughs> so, yes. So, in fact, we lost one of our prosecutors to a $40,000 raise to the public defender's office. So now I'm working on salary parity for our staff. What we're finding, um, and this is interesting, there's, there's actually a law review article about this, that people who go to law school, um, there are fewer, fewer passing the bar, but people who want to come into criminal work want to be public defendants. They don't want to be prosecutors. And so that's changed. You know, in the past, we would have hundreds of applications and we posted. We do still have a lot of applications, and we've been very fortunate in being able to hire people who really want to work in a different kind of prosecutor's office. But having said that, we have to pay people well. Um, and this is where attracting uh, diversity comes into play. We also have to retain people. And one of the really interesting things I discovered when I came in, and I suppose if I had thought about this, it would have come to me, but I didn't really know it until I got into the office. The Jamar Clark to Noor to George Floyd and everything that was in between really caused a lot of trauma in the office, particularly with our staff of color. And I've heard over and over that staff of color just don't feel like it's their office that some are embarrassed to identify themselves as working for the county attorney's office. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do in making the office recruiting, first of all, and retaining people and making them feel like this is their office too. I think it's going to be a struggle because, and I was, I heard one of our supervisors say this this morning, we, we had a youth symposium last week and we had uh, the head of the federal government, um, uh, head of juvenile prosecution essentially, come to town and support what we're doing on youth uh, prosecution. But a lot of our staff was there, uh, particularly in youth prosecution, and some feedback I heard was one of our staff saying, it's really hard to be a black lawyer and be in prosecution. Even if you're trying to do the right thing, even if you're trying to reform, it's still very tough because, unfortunately, a lot of people that you see look like you. So we have a lot of ways to go um, to create an environment that's trauma-informed and supportive of all of our staff. So that's something we're going to continue to work on. Where have you made the biggest progress with regards to criminal justice reform from your perspective? So a huge issue, which is going to be ongoing for some time, is how do you change a culture? How do you change the culture um, from kind of a punitive, 
uh, we're here, and I'm talking about criminal prosecution, to prosecute people, and we're seeking the longest sentences possible, to what our framework now, which is what problem are we trying to solve? What are we doing? We have to be able to answer that question. Why are we doing a particular thing? Why did we charge this case? Why are we asking for this? And what problem are we trying to solve? And I think we're doing a pretty good job of changing that culture. Part of it has to do with the number of hires we've had come in who are values aligned and really want to do something different. Uh, the culture change takes a long time, and there's some resistance to that. I think one of the most difficult things can be if you are in a career, and I was in public defense for some time, you know, I can think back on, you know, early in my career I never challenged fingerprints because we were all told that fingerprints were invalid. Well, we know they're not, right? And so at some point I educated myself about that and I started challenging them. I actually challenged fingerprints in our court of appeals. Um, but for a long time I didn't, and so, there are many things that we do that we can look back on in the criminal legal system where we can realize, well, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing or I thought whatever, but I did harm. And I think we have to maintain humility to be able to acknowledge, maybe I thought that was right at the time, but it wasn't, and I have to do better. And so that's a struggle sometimes when you think, hey, I was seeking these really long prison sentences because I thought that that was the right thing to do. Or we were prosecuting all these low-level drug cases because I thought that was the right thing to do. And we now know, you know, sending people to jail for drug cases is not going to help them with addiction. So we have a lot of work to do in continuing to nudge people. Um, I think you know this. The system is just kind of function the way it functions without a lot of thought into is what we're doing actually working. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're continuing to work on that. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that you use the terminology of the criminal legal system instead of criminal justice system. Can you educate people about why you use that particular terminology? Sure. Um, the, for many people, the criminal legal system has had no justice attached to it. So. I think rather than saying criminal justice system, which has not provided justice for many, um, it's more accurate to say criminal legal system. What are some of the roadblocks that you have encountered in terms of trying to push for the changes that you want to see within the system? Yeah, that started out in my first week. Um, <laughs> we, yeah. We actually would have a prosecutor lie to a judge in a sexual assault trial. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is the decision we ultimately made was very victim-centered. And because it was victim-centered, we didn't share widely what was happening in the trial. We ended up dismissing the case, and that ended up being, I, well, we don't care about victims. Um, so that started out there. That was, was that a minor who was the victim? It was, it was. Um, and we, like I said, I believe it was my third day in office. And that decision to dismiss was actually made by uh, a group of us, a team of our supervisors. That was, you know, imagine me getting there, and I don't know those supervisors were all kind of thrust into the situation, trying to figure out how to salvage this case, but also the victim centered. And I, I believe, I know, I feel we did the right thing there that was victim centered. And because it's victim centered, we can't talk, or I won't talk about some of the facts that led us to that decision. But it ended up being all this criticism about we don't care about victims. And then, uh, less than a month later, we had one of the two really well publicized youth cases involving a murder. Um, both actually had to do, their both cases had to do with 15 year olds who were accused of murder, who were charged with murder. And one of the things that came into office to change was our approach to youth justice. Uh, and part of that is recognizing that youth are youth, kids are kids. No matter what they do, and I know um, we encountered a lot of resistance on that, even among our staff. 
people think, well, yes, treat kids like kids until a certain point where they cross a certain line. Where actually we know, because of brain development, all of that, no matter what kids do as youth, they are capable of change. They are capable of rehabilitation. And so we made some decisions in some youth cases that uh, brought a lot of attention. And so it, we have a lot of work to do with our staff, a lot of work to do with the public to educate people about, or talk to people about, hey, why are we doing this? It's not because we don't care about victims or victims' families. Our job, though, my job, what I was elected to do, was to look at public safety. And so, because of that, I have to look at the particular person who committed this crime. What is it that we can do to solve the problem? And with youth that are 15, um, we can send them to prison. And we know the outcomes. They're going to get out in the early 30s, probably, and the outcomes are terrible. They almost always go back to prison. Or we can try to do our best to rehabilitate them and support them in that rehabilitation so that they will be safe when they re-enter the community. Now, that's hard for families. And I talk to families frequently who are upset because they feel that we're not listening to what they say. And I think there's, there's kind of a misunderstanding about that. Yes, we have to listen. Yes, I do meet with families, and I, I hear them. But hearing their grief and holding space for that pain is very different than doing everything that they want us to do. I met with, uh, I met with one mother recently who said she wanted the death penalty. And we don't have the death penalty here, which I support. And we don't have it for good reasons. You're, you're not saying you support the death penalty. No. Yeah, we sorry. Yes, we should not have the death penalty. It's very misapplied in a very recent way. Yeah, I don't believe that killing people, the group that killing people is the right thing to do. But I understood her grief. I understood why she was asking for that. But that doesn't mean we do that. And so my job is to create the space to hear the pain, the grief from victims, but ultimately, and the families, but ultimately decide what is in the public interest, the best public interest of public safety in this particular case. So we made a lot of progress, and I mentioned this new symposium we had. Um, what was interesting about that is, um, so we have the head of uh, juvenile justice from the Department of, uh, DOJ, Department of Justice, and there was something to some people about the fact, and there was one comment made by a reporter saying, Oh, there's a method to your madness. <laughs> so you get some people from the outside coming in saying, hey, you know, we're totally aligned with what you're doing. And then people will say, oh, oh, you're not, you know, this is not coming from out of left field. Right, it's not coming out of left field. Yeah, science. Yes. Um, in terms of your decision making. Yes. And I think that, so you guys recall the incident is talking about where um, I think she was a young black woman who was a mother who wound up being shot and killed and there were a couple of teenagers one of whom wound up pulling the trigger but there was an adult who was apparently um, encouraging or influencing them and so your strategy was to go harder on the adult who was responsible and to allow the children to go through more of a juvenile process as opposed to an adult prison sentence. That was a huge paradigm shift compared to how the county attorney's office normally operated. And of course, there was a lot of outrage from members of the community, but also family members of the young woman who was killed. Because what they were looking at was this person, this, whether it's a child or an adult, if they pull the trigger, they should have to spend X amount of years behind bars. And I think one of the things that was interesting was that we saw the governor move hastily in comparison to <laughs> other circumstances to remove that case from your office. 
and into the hands of the Attorney General. Now, I kind of joked about hastily because, you know, anybody who's been watching what's been happening with police accountability, we've had to apply a lot of pressure for the governor to intervene and to get the Attorney General to intervene. Um, even with, you know, we did it once with um, after George Floyd was killed in terms of putting pressure on the governor to take that case from Mike Freeman. And then we did it again after Dante Wright was killed. And at that point, both the governor and the attorney general said no. And they were adamant that the attorney general would not take that case. And so we had to use some different tactics and go to the prosecutor's house multiple times for him to finally relinquish the case. And that's how the AG got the case. And so in this situation, we were thinking, how are you all able to move so quickly to shift this case when that has not been your normal practice? And I thought about everything Mike Freeman essentially got away with yeah. without any higher level intervention by the governor or anyone else. So can you take us back to that period of time of some of the dynamics and your reaction to them taking the case and further politicizing uh, a very tragic situation? It, it was a tragic situation, and um, there were two youth uh, that were manipulated by the ex-boyfriend of this young woman who was murdered. One of the youths was 15, um, the other was I think 17. And you know, sometimes it's helpful for people to know that the adult provided the gun, drove them over there. Um, the plan, and, and this is part of the problem when you have 15 year olds with a gun, um, things did not go as planned. The 15 year old not only ended up shooting the, the woman, he shot his brother in the leg too. People don't know that. It was chaotic. You know, it's been described as some kind of execution. It was not. It was a chaotic scene that you might imagine with a 15-year-old who thinks they're going over there to do something and things don't go the way they're planned. So we looked at his history. And you know, it's probably important to say that we have certified youth since I've been county attorney. What does that mean for those yes. who may not be familiar with that certification language? Move the court to treat them as adults. And we have sent juveniles or youth after they've been certified to prison. And I hate that. I hate it. We also don't have the tools to keep some youth safe. We just don't have them. And we've been doing a lot of advocacy to get those tools. Um, and you know, the truth is we fail youth all the time because I look at these what are called certification studies. So somebody in probation does a study history on this youth, and I look at those, and I see all these failures. That's what they're char characterizing of the youth. Youth failed this. Youth failed that. And I always think, was it the youth that failed, or was it us that failed? Because this kid got to that point. And we're not at a point where we are working with youth uh, really, really well, who are in risky situations. And sometimes they just have a really long history. They're 17. Another thing that would be helpful is if we could have jurisdiction. So when a kid turns 18, they're an adult. Even if we, um, there's some things we can do to extend that jurisdiction, but not long. And so when you have a kid who's 17 who's committed a violent act and has this horrific history, we have some youth like that to prison. And I don't want to do that um, because that's not in the best interest of public safety. In any event, we looked at this youth's history, this 15 year old. We looked at the fact that he was manipulated by this adult, provided the gun, driven over there, driven away. We filed charges, murder charges against the adult. We were prepared to indict him before a grand jury because this was a domestic violence case. Um, we take those very seriously. And then um, when we informed the family that we were going to not certify the case, that's when the attorney general got involved and the governor got involved. That, that was very quick, although it did 
I think, in our world, take about three or four weeks of trying to convince uh, the governor and the attorney general that this was a really bad idea. This was my second month. So I am newly elected county attorney. I have talked about a different approach to youth. I'm a woman, um, and I'm going to tell you, I don't think this ever would have happened to a man. Mm. I don't see that at all. And they're taking a case away in um, now the, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association adamantly opposed them taking the case away because we county attorneys, and there are 87 of us, are elected by the people in our county. And I was elected talking about these things. And if people are unhappy about that, they can unelect me, you know, not reelect me. It is. It was a political decision, which is really. I have to tell you, when I think about this case, I think about the tragedy of it, and I think most people don't know this. Third, so um, the 15-year-old was scheduled to go to court Friday morning. Thursday afternoon, his lawyer spent the afternoon preparing him to go to court and what was going to happen. We received notice late. Thursday, that the governor was taking the case away. Can you imagine? And I know I, I'm not, I mean, I have empathy for that 15 year old child, right? Who was told this is what's going to happen, and then it didn't happen. He's still sitting there, not knowing what's going to happen to him. Wow. He is still in the juvenile detention center. And his certification hearing with the AG is trying to certify him as an adult. What's happening next 15 year old? Jesus. Wow. So, you know, we, we need to have space. We need to hold space for the tragedy. And I can't imagine what it's like for the family, for the sisters who have lost their loved one. We can hold that and also see, try to hold space for the circumstances in which this tragic event happened. Hold that youth accountable, because youth do need to be held accountable for their actions, but recognize what makes sense in terms of public safety, in terms of rehabilitation. And so it, it was a terrible situation for me. Um, brand new, you know, they come in and take the case away. It's publicized everywhere. Um, and, you know, one of the things I promised myself coming into this world, and I used to talk about it during the campaign, is saying, I'm not political. And people were saying, yes, you are. You probably said, yes, you are. So what I did promise myself was that we would not make decisions for political purposes. There were times in that three weeks when I could have, had I agreed to certify that kid, they would not have taken the case away. I was under a lot of pressure to do things to keep this out of the media. And I cannot tell you how stressful that was for me and our entire team. But we stuck to our values and our beliefs. And I can tell you, after one year in office, I can look myself in the eyes, in the mirror, and know that the decisions that we made this last year were values aligned, and we never caved to political pressure.
Is that something that you have had to experience with the public, with colleagues, with uh, you know other elected officials, like pushing back against that narrative? Oh yes, um, very publicized. Um, <clears throat> that actually came up in this case we're talking about, and another news case we're talking about. And you know when families are upset, um, understandably, and they go to the press. Um, that's probably the most common thing that people say is you're still a public defender. Um, you don't understand your role. And the way I answer that is, <laughs> we, I, I sometimes look at the number of people we've sent to prison and I, I am not a public defender anymore. It just, but my role is different. When I was a public defender, I represented one client at a time. And my role was to represent them as best I could. That is not my role as county attorney. My role, um, and this is actually um, why this job can be really, really difficult. Everything is tragic. When we chart, you know, we handled the Deshaun Hill trial, right? Guy was convicted, went to prison for a long period of time. That's not something I feel good about, right? He needs to be there. Um, he needs to be incapacitated because he's not safe. But Deshaun Hill's not coming back. And I look at these cases, I hear about them, we talk about them every week, and we are never able to bring people back. And the tools that we have are never going to be enough um, to start the healing for a family. And so I approach this role as I have to look at public safety. And that is why there have been times we have certified youth. Because if I'm looking at public safety and I, I look at this youth and I see, do we have the resources to be able to help him? It's usually a him. Um, and the answer is no. Then I have to do things that I don't want to do because I have to be looking at public safety. I think the big difference, the thing that people don't get is that I bring a lens where I sat next to clients and I would talk to them about their histories and hear all kinds of trauma and often thought to myself, if we had intervened when this person was young, when he was in foster care, when he was sexually abused, when all this stuff happened, he wouldn't be sitting next to me. And so I understand that there isn't a you know perpetrator and a victim, like a pristine stereotypical victim. Hurt people hurt people. There's, we have you know, a victim today who might be somebody who harms somebody else tomorrow. And so I bring that lens of understanding how people get themselves or how they end up in these situations. And that's a help is also huge. Yeah, that's huge. That's huge. And so what I think people are starting to connect is if you talk about effective ways of intervening, that's actually public safety. It's not different. It's like <laughs> people say, well, you're soft on crime, that kind of thing. No, we're effective on crime. We're effective. Yes. And effectiveness is about prevention. It's about intervening in effective ways. And what you have to, it can be about incapacitating people who just aren't safe in the community. And I will simply talk about our youth auto initiative, but one of the things I love about that, we can look at the data and say this is successful. If you looked at the data, if you look at it now, people coming out of prison, how many people go back? How many people pick up something? Else? The what we call recidivism rates are really high. So what we've been doing in this system for decades has harmed people if we are not safer. Which we know is expensive, right? And we, we have the highest prison population rate in the world, and we are definitely not the safest country in the world. So what we've been doing hasn't worked. It's been harmful, particularly to people of color. Um, and so we do need to do something different, something that works. So before we started this conversation, you were talking about a change that happened at the legislature that will provide some, some level of relief for people who are peripherally involved in felony murder cases. So one, can you talk about that change? And you know, I don't know if you want to share you know, that you had your first case like that today. And then I want to shift 
into talking about the prosecutor initiated sentence adjustment. I don't know if you guys were able to pick up a flyer, but make sure that you grab one at the end. And I'm going to have Mary talk about this as one of the new initiatives coming out of her office. So, because <coughs> so many people were sent to prison, are still there on really, really long sentences. And by the way, we know that from research, there's a period of time you can sentence somebody, um, and beyond that, it really it doesn't do anything. It's just harmful, um, it costs money, as you say. So we have a lot of people who were sentenced to really long prison terms. And this year, the legislature gave us a couple of tools, I'll be talking about that one, but one of the tools um, that they gave us is this. How many of you have heard of the concept of felony murder? So those are situations where you're with somebody, a pal, and you go out and, and you are maybe going to do a drug deal, get some drugs, something like that. Your partner goes off and shoots somebody or something like that. Historically, this office, our office, and offices throughout the state have charged both people um, with the same crime. Um, and that has been actually it, paradoxically. So a lot of times, if you're the person that fired the gun and there's a good case against you, you take a plea negotiation because you know you're not going to prevail at trial. And then the person who really was kind of along for the ride says, wait, and because the law says you actually get the same sentence. Um, and it's up to the prosecutor to decide to give you some lesser kind of sentence, but legally you can get exactly the same sentence as the person who is the, the leader of this. And so what you see is people who are like, what do you mean you want me to go to prison? I was just in the car. I thought we were going over there to get some drugs, and then this turned into something else. So that's called felony murder. Our legislature changed that. Um, you have, going forward, you have to be what's called a major participant to be prosecuted for felony murder. And so we had, so people who are eligible, and this gets complicated, so I'll, I'll be kind of high level about it. People who were convicted of felony murder can petition their county attorney. Uh, there's a process to go through. There's a petition if we feel that the person should be sentenced. We did make that recommendation in a case, a very first case heard in Minnesota, actually, this morning, and that person was resentenced and I believe was released from prison this morning. Them 
with aiding and abetting murder. So really going forward, have looked at each person to see what their actual involvement is so that we aren't prosecuting people willy-nilly on aiding and abetting because that has the same sentence as well. That's right. Wow. So when the... Um, so guilty by association. Yes. Yes. That's kind of standard practice. Yes. So we are not doing that anymore. Um, and so I will say going forward this entire year, we, you know, what we are looking at those. So there's the corrective action to try to correct what's happened in the past. And then there's a different philosophy. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, can you talk about the prosecutor-initiated sentence adjustment? Yes. PISA. It's a mouthful. So um, this is actually called prosecutor-initiated resentencing in the rest of the country, and I think actually Ramsey County calls it that too. Our legislature, the bill was actually called prosecutor-initiated sentencing adjustment, and I think that's a, an important distinction. Labels kind of matter. So that's what we're calling it, PISA. What does that mean? There are, as we talked about, um, people who are in prison for really long periods of time and they don't need to be there anymore. They're safe, they can be safe in the community or they have health problems. They just don't need to be there anymore. And a, a key component of this is that in Minnesota, we have what are called the sentencing guidelines. If you get sentenced on a felony, if you go to prison in Minnesota, you know you will do two-thirds of your sentence, and then you'll get out the last third on what we call supervised release. We don't have parole in Minnesota. And you, you hear this on TV and in other states, somebody gets sentenced to 10 to 30 years. And what that means is that at 10 years, you come before a parole board, and that parole board, theoretically, they don't know that it always works like this, but can look at your history and see what you've done in prison, especially for youth. We know there's a lot of growth um, when people go to prison as youth. Um, we know that people age out of crime. So at, when you have a parole board, they are able to go back and see, is this person safe to be in the community? Up until this legislation, we haven't had that ability. Because you do two thirds of your time and that's it. Unless there was some something wrong legally with your conviction. So now the legislature has given us PISA, and the concept there is that we can look at people's convictions, uh, and essentially we can petition the court to adjust their sentence, as opposed to resentencing. Because sometimes people think, well, why are you resentencing? And we aren't. We're looking at this person's history, and should there be an adjustment based on what we now know? And so the way this works, we got all the data from the Department of Corrections, we know who's there in prison, on what, how old they were when they got there, how old they are, all of this data. And what we are doing is if, and we're just putting up an application process next week, I think we're working out with the prisons that the application is available for people who don't have access to computers. But the idea is, if we look at a case, we ask for the file from the prison. We will look at that file, and because we know that infractions in prison are you know, not necessarily indicative of how somebody's doing, we'll look at that, but we'll also look at what have they been doing in prison? How are they now? Um, we look at re-entry plans a little bit, and ultimately, again, we reach out to the um, potential victim, if there was a victim or victim's families, uh, to see what they have to say about it. And if we think it's appropriate, we will petition the judge to adjust the sentence. Now, we haven't had one of those yet, um, and ultimately it's up to the judge to decide. But it is a wonderful way of looking at some of the long sentences or sentences that people got um, and seeing how they're doing and if they can be safe in the community, uh, getting their sentence adjusted so that they can go home. Do they have to submit a petition, or how do you even find out which cases should yes. qualify? Yes, two ways. So we, as I mentioned, we got all the data. 
we were trying to think of, because part of this is going to be a resource issue for us, um, we were trying to figure out what classification of cases can we look at, can we start with. Is it people who are over 60? Is it people who got in as a teenager? What is that? So we looked at all the data. Um, we also, as I said, we're going to put up the application. People can fill out an application. It's not meant to be buried. It's meant to be very simple. If, if people just give us basic information, we can help with that. Um, the other thing is, we don't want, and this is happening to families, as you know, they pay a lot of money uh, to hire a lawyer to try to do post-conviction or make their case. We, while people can hire lawyers, that's not going to get them to the front of the line. Um, because we and we are working on a process where we will get people lawyers if they want a lawyer, but we don't want people who have some privilege or some advantage. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if we don't want families to have to spend that money, I've heard countless stories of families who have given money and just haven't really gotten much of it. I should make this distinction. So PISA. The, the sentencing, you, the idea is you were guilty of what you did, but your sentence is too long, okay? So, we can also talk about, we are going to, we're working on getting a conviction integrity unit ready. That's probably coming at the end of this year. That is for innocence claims. So, just, and I know it gets confusing, but there, there are these other avenues now. Even if you are guilty, I mean, that's what the assumption is, that you did something or you did what you got in prison for, is that the sentence was too long, or maybe at the time it seemed like it was appropriate, but we look at it and it just isn't appropriate now. So, in terms of correcting these long prison sentences, we now have a couple of tools that we did have. How can people who want to submit um, a case for review get in touch with their office? So on a piece of plan. Yeah, on a piece of plan, um, we've been working with uh, Department of Corrections because people don't. It, we, we're going to have an online application, but we understand that people don't have access to the computer. So we're getting paper applications, and I think they're going to help distribute those. That's good to know. And maybe from a community-based perspective, there are people who can play a role in terms of helping to streamline well, the know, process. Well, that's a really good point, too, because we don't want the, the only people to apply are people that heard about it, and we don't want to leave out people who didn't hear about it. So that's another reason why we're kind of, we're trying to go through classification of cases, too. There may be people who just don't have people out here to advocate for them. We don't want to leave them. Absolutely, and we can't solely rely on the Department of Corrections for very obvious reasons. So uh, we'll follow up to see how, as a community, we can provide support. I want to cover two more topics with you, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, you talked a lot about Brady in the past. Can you talk to people about what the Brady Law entails, why is it important, and any changes that your office has made around Brady? Yes. So, Brady, Giglio, you know, um, they're actually names of cases. Okay? But what do they signify? Essentially, they tell us, prosecutors, the, the Supreme Court has told us that we have an obligation to seek out information from the team. The team is very broadly described. The prosecution team includes law enforcement. Okay? Even though they don't work for us, um, it includes anyone on the prosecution team. We are required to hand over information to the defense that might potentially be favorable to the defense. So um, I have been very outspoken about this issue. Uh, when I was chief public defender, there were a couple of cases that came up. I remember one in particular, a uh, nurse at Hennepin County uh, who was doing sexual assault examinations uh, was fired 
um, for and lied on her resume, if I recall. And that was not disclosed to us, and she was an expert in a bunch of cases that we had. Um, and that was a violation of Brady, because obviously, as a defense lawyer, you would want that information so that you can cross-examine, or you know, you can do something with it. So I wondered about the Brady policy when I got into office, and so what the policy sort of had been, there's a difference between public and non-public information. So when, when a police officer is disciplined by the chief, and that discipline becomes public, um, that's pretty much what the office was turning over to defense. But there were, there were a couple of issues with that, and I should say that Brady has a couple of components. It has to do with what we as prosecutors get and what we as prosecutors disclose or hand over to the defense. So this was an issue of great importance to me, um, and it took a long time. We're still in the process of developing, we have really developed the policy, but we have something like 38 different law enforcement entities in Kennebec County. So we have to work with all of them. Um, we had to work with a system internally that only collected the public information, not, they didn't collect any of the private stuff. And here's why that's a problem. For some agencies, like MPD, we've all heard the stories about coaching, right? So, well, one chief, and I, I can pick on MPD, but you know, the chief can decide, um, or by contract, um, too, well, what is, what is appropriate for coaching? What is the disciplinary matrix, right? And whatever they decide is coachable or not really doesn't impact what we have to hand over to the defense. And so we need access to non-public information because that is also discoverable, or we have to hand it over. But the office wasn't getting any of that. And of course, it wasn't handing it over. Michelle just said we didn't want it. Um, yeah. So um, the other thing that it was problematic was that the only way the defense got it, this information, which was public, was if they, if the defense demanded a hearing, so like a trial, something where witnesses were subpoenaed. And we have a, a database called Subpoena Plus. You put in the names of witnesses you want to subpoena, and then and only then would a flag come up indicating that you should go talk to your supervisor because there may be Brady material there. Well, the problem with that is most cases actually settled before trial. So there were many, many cases where the person, they, they settled without ever potentially knowing about this information. So I, I hope people can kind of get a sense of what a difficult lift this has been. I want to give a big shout out to Claire Deagle, who is the head of our Professional Standards Division, because this has been her project uh, since she got there. So we are at the point where you know, we have been working with law enforcement throughout Hennepin County. We, I meet with them once a month. Um, Brady was something that we developed with them, got feedback from them, um, and they've been very compliant to that. So we are getting public information. Um, with non-public information, we have to get a court order. Um, the, what law enforcement is concerned about is if it is not public, that it not be out there in the ether, so we have to get a protective order from the court. So, um, I don't, I mean, big picture, our Brady policy is what it should be. Um, it is, it fulfills our requirements to go out and find information. Another thing that the office did was have MOUs with every single law enforcement entity, which just required them to send final discipline. So there was no way of knowing um, as the case were to move the, the process, whether there was actually something that the office needed to disclose. 
So I feel pretty good about where we're at now in terms of collecting the information. We still have some work to do with trying to get um, the system moved up so that we were getting it to people as early as we want to. But we've made dramatic changes. I will say, um, you know, I thought, well, when I came in and I talked, I knew that the suburban, all of the police chiefs did not have a good relationship with my president. There was no communication there. So, a little bit shocked about that, to be honest. I know, I know. I was kind of too. Um, it, there was just no communication there whatsoever. And so I, uh, I listened to them and I said, you know, what do you need from me? And they said, we don't want to hear about policy changes in the newspaper. We'd like to hear them from you first. I said, you got it. And so we told them about our proposed grading plan. And over a period of months, they gave input, feedback. And so we are, I would say, they are compliant. Uh, we're pretty much on the same page in terms of compliance. And so it's been a pleasant surprise, perhaps, that we have a much more, uh, I would say, progressive that it actually follows the law. Um, <laughs> very transparent. Very transparent. Yeah. And that's yeah, and that's what, um, and the other thing is, we don't want to, so, so why is this important, right? It's important because there are times, many times, when some, you know, some conviction is reversed, right? Where there's something going on with the conviction, and then you look in the file, and there's stuff that indicated it might have been something else, or indicated that this police officer had done something that should have been disclosed. So this is all about fair trial. You know, if you want to look at it from a prosecutor perspective, you should be caring about fair trials, but we also care about convicting the right person, right? Um, and, yeah, and so the defense should have this information. Um, and it's, so us disclosing it does not necessarily mean it comes in. So people might be interested in that. Very often, the judge rules it doesn't come in because it's not relevant. And that's fine. I just I want us to be disclosing information early on. And one of the things that I think was meaningful to police chiefs is, do you really like uh, getting blindsided by questions when your cop's on the stand? No. You know, do our lawyers really want to deal with this? Um, on the eve of their trial? No. Let's hand this stuff over. We can get up and litigate whether it comes in or not. We'll know whether it is, and then we'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. So it's a much better process for everyone. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. It's really interesting to hear you talk about essentially building a rapport with some of the police chiefs and law enforcement agencies. I think you said that there are, is it 38? I love that. Yes. 38 agencies that you connect with. Can you describe your approach to working with law enforcement and how, <laughs> how you've been able to, I would say, break through some of the barriers? Yeah, I'm laughing because I have said to them, I know I'm your worst nightmare. I know you didn't want me to win. <laughs> you think I'm to get you. So let's start there. Um, and I have, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the only thing that I need, right? Yeah. And so then they can all laugh and say, yeah, you know, we're worried you're out to get us kind of thing. And I, I really believe in transparency. I really believe in that. And so building relationships with them, what I've always said to them is, I'm going to be transparent. Um, we are not always going to agree. You can tell me whatever you want to tell me. I'll try to answer your question. Um, but I'm going to be transparent, and I will push back against them if there's something um, that I disagree with. Oftentimes I find that it's just not understanding what we're doing. So I think, and we've been this in a lot of time, like I said, I meet with them once a month, but it's actually in four different groups. So I have four meetings with all of the chiefs once a month. And it's paying off in the sense that um, some of them still don't like me. Um, some of them still think I'd love to get them, but they agree, hey, 
you've been really transparent with us. I also assigned one of our experienced lawyers to be a liaison to them. And so sometimes the way this works is one of them will say, well, we're upset about how you're declining our drug cases. And I will say, oh, first I'll say, you should pick up the phone and call us. You have a liaison, you can do that. But my grandmother's our liaison, I'll say, Mike, can you check that out? And we'll look at the data. And if it isn't, and Mike will meet with the chief and say, here's the data on what we declined. And there have been times where um, they've had a point, and then we'll correct that. And there are times when they just think that, and it's not the case. So transparency and communication is critical. Um, but it's always a, it's tenuous, I would say, and there are always issues that will come up. But I've always said to them, they're going to communicate with you, uh, ask questions. I think the biggest frustration for me is that I make myself available and they don't ask questions. They do kind of a Minnesota passive aggressive thing. Uh, so we just have a meeting today, actually, where we're talking about, OK, how do we get you guys to, because they're mostly guys, ask us questions? instead of talking about something and getting yourself moved up where it really isn't true right. or we can just talk about it. So it's taken a lot of work, but I think we've mostly reached a point, and there's some, you know, at some point one of the chiefs said, I think you have about 75% of the chiefs, 15, you have 25% so you're never gonna get. And really that's about communication. And, and trusting relationships in that, I'm going to be honest with you, um, you you're not going to agree on everything, and if you ask me a question, I'm going to answer it if I can. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So one question that comes up has to do with past cases that maybe happened before you became a county attorney involving the police use of deadly force. Yes. Does your office plan to set up a process or do you have a process? for potentially evaluating some of those cases where it's clear that something happened that maybe should not have happened, and there needs to still be some accountability. So I have met with families on some of those cases, and I know that those are, I mean, families, it's extremely painful. And my hope is, um, I mean, my answer right now is that we do not have the capacity to be going and looking back at cases involving um, law or law enforcement use of force. We have so just so we get investigations from the PCA submitted to us, um, and one of the things I discovered from talking to police chiefs is that um, before I came, it could take years for the office to make a decision on those. Um, and there are a lot of cases you don't hear about, um, but, but we, and, and to me, taking a couple of years to make a decision is unacceptable um, for the family, for the law enforcement officer. And so we committed to um, speeding up that process of the current cases that we have so that law enforcement, family, um, anybody involved can can know we will have a decision by a particular um, So we are very short-staffed, um, especially well, in the area of prosecutors who are experienced in serious cases. Here's another issue. Um, many of our prosecutors do not want to have anything to do with officer-involved cases. And part of that is that Police, and I've heard this in the past, will not work with our staff who prosecute those cases. And so I understand that. I understand um, some of our staff saying, well, this might be a career ending thing for me. I understand now having charged the Trooper case, um, the, the Ricky Cobb, the second yeah. police. Mm. Yes. Yes. The, okay. the But the level of threats and pushback, and now they're going to talk about their case, but it's, there are a lot of pressures. Um, and I understand with our staff, uh, people saying, 
I don't want to have anything to do with those cases. But why we need to build our capacity to be able to do them, um, to be able to have the, the knowledge and the skill set to take a look at them, even some cases that happened before. Mm -hmm. So, especially some cases. Yeah, that especially. That right. before. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Which, and my honest answer is right now, we don't have that capacity. We, and, and when I say capacity, what does that mean? It, it takes a lot of work to look at those types of cases. It takes some expertise in the law because the law is very different. As you know, the, the law does give law enforcement protections that other people don't have. Um, and so we, we need to build our capacity. We need to get people trained. We, need to, we somehow need to get into a situation where it is acceptable for people to actually work on those cases. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I really don't. Um, I did a willingness to set up a process like that because there are still so many family members <coughs> yes. who got no justice. Yes, I mean, right. look at Terrence Franklin's yep. yeah. yes. Yes. Love yes. case. Yes. Very clear, Time Love Magazine, yes. Yes. right, went and yes. looked at the information in the Terrence Franklin case. Mirror life. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I think what we don't want to have happen is because it's too hard or because there's no resources that killers are essentially walking around free. Yeah, you asked me if there's a willingness to look at things, so the answer is yes. Um, my hesitation is not even a hesitation when I talk about resources, <coughs> it is where do we find the people that are willing to do that? Mm. Because it's it costs. You know, like I, I was talking to um, somebody about what's happened in the past for people who do prosecute those cases. And law enforcement won't work with them. Or they, it's kind of a passive aggressive. They're not saying we're not going to work with you, but they don't. And so if you are a prosecutor, um, what do you do? And I know what the answer would be. But if you are afraid, hey, I need law enforcement to be able to prosecute my cases, and if I work or prosecute a case like this, they're not going to work with me. That's where the tension is. And I'm not saying that that person may decide being a prosecutor is no longer for them, but that should not trump, no pun intended, it should not trump <laughs> whether there is a pursuit of justice in a legitimate case. Because as some of you guys here, you're activists. Yeah. Right? We, we face retaliation, backlash, and attacks, and we continue to persevere for the cause of justice. And so a prosecutor has to put their own discomfort on the line mm -hmm. for the higher goal of achieving justice and sending a message to police officers that we're not going to tolerate the unlawful, unjustified use of deadly force on the media. You know, I agree. I, I do agree with that, and I will also say, I give deference. Mm. And yes, I agree with you, and I was elected, I can't necessarily say I signed up for this, <laughs> but it's really unpleasant. <laughs> I mean, it's not even unpleasant. What it's done to my family, my partner, me, mm -hmm. it's really hard. And I guess what I would say is, we need to create a culture and that stuff isn't okay. Yes. You know, yes. I should, and our staff should be okay. Yes. Yes. And all this stuff that's on social media about, and I try not to look at that, but, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make excuses, but I'm also saying the reality of it is who wants to put themselves in this situation um, knowing that they're going to face that kind of thing. Justification for not pursuing justice. 
Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, in an officer, it shoots and deadly force. We right. are, and, and, we and are a, fighting. A crime is a crime. Right. It shouldn't matter who commits that crime. Oh, you know, I'm if it's a rich disagree. person or a poor person or a cop or whatever, a crime's right. a crime. I'm not disagreeing. Oh, I know, and I'm not, I'm just saying it, you know. As, but, but I'm also yeah. saying, um, I did sign up for this. Um, I look at some of our staff with kids and family, and I know. All of you do too. I know that. <laughs> I know that. I know that. Right. And you're talking about public safety. It's a matter of public safety for us. For, and, I, and when I say us, I should really exclude myself. I'm talking about mostly, you know, people of color, especially African American men, you know, having to be at high risk of, you know, injury or death because of police conduct. You know, that's a public safety matter also. Well, what I would like to see actually, and I do, I do say this to police officers that. Um, you know, they will say, I'm not talking about a particular case, they will agree that something is a crime. I'm sorry, sorry. Sorry, they will agree, but they don't say that publicly. Mm. I think we That's need to problem. get to a point where we and they can acknowledge yeah. that in a given situation, there was a crime committed. Yes. We're not at that point. We're not at that point at all. Um, but that's the place we need to be. And we need. You know, when you look at um, cases, what you always see is uh, character assassination of the victim, yes, right? Every time. Every time. And to me, it doesn't matter. That person has loved ones and family rights to live. But we're in that space where they go back and pick out every last thing, you know, and, and make it about that person's past. And we don't do that in other cases that don't involve police. So we have a long way to go in terms of changing the culture. We do. I would just say, as someone who has been in the fight for a long time, as a black woman, mother, etc., I do want to challenge your office to be much more vigilant when it comes to looking at past cases. All of the excuses that these individuals make who don't want to Peel back the curtain. This is what we've been dealing with for decades, and that's how we got here, that's right. right? To the point of finally the world paying attention when George Floyd was killed. Yeah. But look how many bodies have been accumulated along the way. Right? Right. And look how hard it still is to get systemic changes within the system. So I would say that if not now, then when? Mm -hmm. If not you, then, then who? Mm -hmm. You have the backing of the community to go back and look and to really push for accountability. And to remind people that anybody in this fight is putting their bodies on the line, putting their families, everything in jeopardy for the sake of justice. Yes. And prosecutors, if they're signing up, they're getting paid, they need to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. Or decide, maybe this is not for me. And I know that may be a hard line, but it's just the reality of the evil that we have been dealing with for far too long. I just don't think we should give a pass because it's uncomfortable. That's right. Yeah. We had to put it all on the line and are only celebrating when they're six feet under and no longer expected. Listen, I'm But I kept showing up. That's the spirit that needs to be brought forward in this community in order for a huge shift to happen. We have a chance to lead the nation and not fall back because people don't have the political will to do the right thing. So I'm going to end my portion there as far as the questions. And um, I want to give you guys in the audience an opportunity to ask their questions directly. We have Pete with the microphone, so I'll just ask that anyone who speaks, you know, that you feel comfortable standing at the break and speaking into the microphone. And I appreciate Gary for being open to this format where people can speak in their own voices and um, usually Say what's on your heart. We have a question. Uh, this isn't really a, well, I guess it'll be a question too, but um, I really, I don't think we say thank you enough. Mm. I want to say uh, thank you to Nakima for pulling our community together. Uh, we have some impacted families that are in the audience today. 
um, impacted families that have lost loved ones at the hands of the police here in this state, as well as um, impacted families who have lost their loved ones to being wrongfully incarcerated uh, here in this state. Um, so I want to tell you thank you to Nakima and everything that you just said, my sister, about, um, you know, basically, if it's too much, then make it a decision like this is too much for me, you know, and I can't, I can't do it or I can't move forward. But we have people that have been sitting in the seats, such as Mike Freeman, that have literally uh, pretty much tortured our community. Right, send people to jail along with Amy Klobuchar for crimes that they didn't commit, um, and then let officers walk free that have lynched, modern day lynched, our families, our people in the community. And so I am just, as someone who is raising my son and lives with this every single day, uh, the injustices being done um, around the United States, but particularly here in Minnesota, um, which Nikima calls the Jim Crow of the North. Um, that's where we're at right now. And um, so thank you for that, Nikima. And then I want to say thank you to you, Mary, for I remember when you were running for office. Um, thank you for being a human being of integrity. Mm. Thank you for what you have fought for us thus far and I know that it's hard and I know that it's scary because I have received death threats so I understand um, the fear from the death threats but I also walk through that fear and I am a mother to a 17 year old son and I don't have a choice but to speak up against the injustices and I'm okay with it. I've made my decision that if if something happens behind that, then that's okay because I know that I'm standing on righteousness and I know that I'm doing the right thing. So I really want to still tell you thank you for just being a, a good-hearted person and standing on righteousness and standing up for what you believe. And we can take this even further and that I am willing and I know that Nakima is willing and I know that Marvina is willing and Michelle Gross and all of us are willing to stand with you and to stand up for you and to fight for you and that you won't be by yourself in this, you know, and that I am willing to be on the side because we know that you are helping to, you're helping to fight for us. We get it, we understand it, but there is an evil that is going on right now in this state and we are at the epitome of corruption That's in right. this state and it's going to take certain people, many are called but only few are chosen. It's going to take certain people to say enough is enough of hurting other human beings for no reason, my friend. Enough is enough, Amy Klobuchar. That's right. Enough is enough, Governor Watts. Enough is enough, Keith Ellison, from sitting back and watching these injustices happen to human beings and saying, I want to protect my political career. I don't want to do too much because I don't want to uh, make certain people mad. Right. We're going to make people mad because That's we're standing right. up against injustices and evil. So we don't have a choice. You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. Right. And that's just what it is. You're either in it or you're not in it. Martin Luther King, there was a part, I'm saying this and I'm going to be quiet because I'm getting just worked up here, but there's a part where I was reading about Martin Luther King and he says in um, his book, where he thought about quitting so many times. He thought about because he was getting the death threats. He was getting all this stuff against him. But he felt like he was too far in to go back now. We're in too far in to go back now. And you're really with us now, Mary. You just held accountable. You got charges put on an officer that wrongfully killed somebody on the side of a highway. So the only thing that we can do is move forward now. But it is going to take those, and I know we may not have the capacity right now, I appreciate you saying that it is a willingness to get back into those other cases because those cases is what led us to where we're at right now. And we can't forget about those people because the blood that has been shed is equally important. So I love you, my sister. I love you, my sister, Nakima. Thank you both for doing this. Thank you as a black woman, a white woman sitting up there trying to figure this 
out, trying to talk it out, and stand on righteousness. Thank you. I just, I wanted to say thank you to Shira. Um, I'm also not going anywhere. Um, uh, and I do see that there are families here that have lost loved ones, and I just wanted to recognize that. Sorry, I didn't hear that. How many cases do you think you'll be able to go back and review in a year? What kind of case? Are you talking about uh, PISA? Or are you talking about felony murder? Or yeah, it's not accountability. And do you have a team? Are, are volunteers, paralegals, <coughs> professionals able to volunteer their man hours? Um, what can be done? What is the game plan? Well, we did get, um, I made a budget request this year and did get staff for our conviction and tenure unit. Um, we are trying to, we did get that. Uh, we are trying to build out our staff uh, to be able to uh, handle, and you're talking about past police cases. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that um, because we have, we just have a lot of cases like with conviction integrity, with PISA, uh, with all of the things that we're doing. I don't know the answer to that. Um, as I said, part of it is training people, having prosecutors who have the experience that can look at these cases. Um, we're going to be working on that. We sent some prosecutors to a uh, conference in California to learn about those cases. It's going to take, and I know this isn't an answer people want to hear, but it's going to take us a little bit of time to build up that capacity. But I want you to know, and you can keep it to know, that I am committed to doing that. We can ask this. Hi, you know who I am. Um, I'm Ms. Harris, one of the impacted families, who, you know, we've already done the reinvestigation for you and had to achieve my son's case. But just respectfully, I'm just here to say that those excuses aren't good enough. So my question is, because you know, I do appreciate you nonetheless, um, uh, what is it that the community can actually do to help? What are the steps? Can we sit down with a meeting with all, all of you? I understand you're talking about the budget, but what steps can we do to quickly make this a reality? Uh, what Liz was talking about is, you know, we do have re we we literally do have people who will do this in all of their free time. They might not be the uh, level of expertise that you need, but we can get you to that point where all that information is right there. So then the, that level that you need to rely on or whatever. But I work with the reinvestigation team and they probably are as good, if not better, than the reinvestigators you guys might have or the investigators you might have. We reinvestigate. So my question is, is what can the community do to help you make this a reality, because the answer is simply cannot be known. But can we put together a team to review all case files and highlight things for you and cite things for you? I mean, at what point of this process are we able to get involved? Yeah, the community wants to work with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you, and, and I'm sorry for the loss, by the way. I don't know if you just like the department. Um, it is, so I know, so these cases are complicated. Um, and I know people don't like to hear that. It, it is kind of like, they, they are more complicated than you know, law enforcement cases. Um, and they require, they do require investigation um, by particular people that can be called as witnesses. Um, we have started in this, so let me take a step back. So there have sometimes been problems with getting statements from law enforcement. That has been the reality. Um, one of the things that we have done is to convene a grand jury uh, to call officers, or subpoena them, 
so that they have to give statements. Not asking the grand jury to make the decision, we make that, but that is a mechanism that we have used um, to make sure that we can get people to talk. Um, if prosecuting a case uh, requires, and that this is, so in most of the cases, we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and I find this comes up frequently. We might all agree that something happened here that shouldn't have happened. And at the same time, to be able to prosecute the case successfully, we have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the thing happened. And it's even harder with officer cases because we have to prove, disprove, we have to prove that what they say didn't happen. In other words, if they say, if I use deadly force, we have to prove that it was not a reasonable use of deadly force beyond a reasonable doubt. And we have to be able to prove that because we see a lot of cases like this, right? Where we can see, hey, it never would have gotten to that point but for the fact that a police officer did X, Y, and Z, right? But the law is pretty narrow in telling us to look at right when it happens. Right? So in that moment, and that's not always the case, it isn't always the case, but in a lot of these cases, you have to look at what happened in that narrow moment. And you have to be able to prove in that narrow moment, beyond reasonable doubt, it wasn't a reasonable use of force. That requires some training, it requires um, a, a, like a lens to look at a particular case, that we need to have experts doing that. Experts, I mean, people who prosecute cases. I appreciate the community help. I think what would be helpful, when I say we don't have the resources, um, I would almost say, yeah, it would, it would be nice to have uh, the county board give us more money for that. But here's the issue. We don't have, we're down, I think, 10 lawyers in our serious felony prosecutor unit. And that is just because those lawyers are in court every day. They try murder after murder after sexual assault after sexual assault. And there are a limited pool of lawyers that have that experience and expertise. And we are in competition with them, with the Public Defender's Office, with the Attorney General's Office, with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And that is the one area where we are having difficulty recruiting because that's just a small pool of people, and those are the people that need to make the decisions about whether we can prosecute a case. And so, <coughs> it's a difficult conundrum, and I know that's not helpful to people who've lost loved ones. My goal, we've started doing more comprehensive training in the office, my goal, we've hired a bunch of new people, um, but it's gonna take them some time to get up to speed. So I, I've talked about all the barriers, um, and I know that that's not a helpful answer. And I just keep saying I, I am committed to doing that, and unfortunately it is going to take us some time to get there. I think we're okay with there being time. We also want to know how we can help bring it to fruition, right? Because beyond the county board, yeah, we can go to the legislature, we can go to philanthropy, if it's a resource issue. Go recruit us some prosecutors. <laughs> <laughs> Get our salaries up. Okay, here's one issue. Yeah, that was an interesting it is, to have it is. Members, yeah. So we'll have Mary answer and then we'll go. Yeah, no, that is one concrete thing we can do. Uh, is to get, uh, we don't have competitive salaries now with the public defenders. Uh, we're, we lost some people to the U.S. Attorney, the Attorney General, and Noga County pays more for their prosecutors. So you can uh, go to the county board. The contract is being, going to, they're going to start negotiating for our staff within a couple of months. So go to the county board and say, we want you to pay the prosecutors. Um, enough money so that they want to come to Hennepin County mm -hmm. and prosecute cases. That, that is a concrete thing we can do. Hi, um, my name is Lori and I'm a resident of Brooklyn Center. 
And um, you mentioned that it's difficult to get your prosecutors to take these cases on for various reasons. We look at you as a leader. You're already setting new trends, and we appreciate that from community. Um, but I would also ask you to be a leader for your own, and I'm sure you already are, but once you have a case and you win it, and you have that precedent, in respect to police accountability, for example, CUAPB has had two cases this year with Marcus Golden and Cordell Handy that were successful. And because of that, CUAPB continues to hold police accountable um, in the respect of civil cases. But what we really need is police accountability and criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you to be a leader and say, we will offer you that protection. If, if you're getting threats, we will offer you protection within the law because as a community, we feel that. We, we know that fear, but we're still out there for free. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, I, I didn't mention this, but part of uh, working with law enforcement, in the past, uh, our, our, my office, if something happened with police, because I remember talking to or when I was appointed to our office, was talking to some supervisors in the county attorney's office saying, what are you going to do about this officer? And the answer was, we're not his employer. That is unacceptable. And so one of the things that we have been doing is when we see something on video, we ask our lawyers to flag that, um, and we will have a conversation with the police chief about a particular thing. And we've had those conversations. Um, and sit down with the chief and the trainer and the person, um, if, if appropriate, to say, hey, we saw this, not a crime, not a crime, but we saw this behavior, this language, this something or another that happened, um, and so far the chiefs have been great about that. And so that's a piece of it that's never existed before, is the, we can be kind of an early accountability system in flagging things that we <coughs> see law enforcement do, don't rise to the level of a crime, but we need to nip in the bud so it doesn't grow in the sun. Yeah, so we are doing that, we have been doing that. It's not, when I was talking about threats, I meant um, for our prosecutors. As you know, if you've ever looked at Crime Watch, Minneapolis, or whatever that is, they put pictures of our prosecutors' faces on there. Um, yeah, they're boxing people. Yeah, they do. And so when I was talking about threats, I signed up for this, right? But our, a lot of our prosecutors didn't. And, and I, I understand what you're saying about this. I think you're a prosecutor, they can do this. But also, is that something they signed their family up for? Is that something that they want to do? But the big, part of the big issue here when I say a lot of our prosecutors don't want to do this work, um, it's also a huge issue. They have gigantic caseloads right now. Yeah. Huge caseloads of serious felonies. They are in trial um, back to back to back on murders, sexual assaults. And so when we have those huge caseloads, and we are taking measures to address those caseloads, to free up at least some time when people can be looking at other cases as well. So it's, I mentioned a lot of different issues. Um, but I just wanted to include that as well. It sounds like a resource issue and a recruitment issue, being the two, because there, I yes. believe there are prosecutors out there who yes. would be open yes. to prosecuting well, these cases. Well, also I should say, um, traditional prosecutors, right, not maybe reform-minded prosecutors, aren't necessarily interested in prosecuting police, right? right? And so there are people out there who can prosecute, who can prosecute police, but don't see themselves as prosecutors. That's the last thing they ever thought they would be, right? So there's a little bit of a, a weird kind of... It's a cultural, yeah. but it's a problem that can be solved. Yes. With the right resources behind it. So I see Marvina has the mic, and then we'll go to 
I think Colin will show Hello, Mary. My name is Marvina Haynes. I'm the founder of Minnesota Wrongfully Convicted Judicial Reform. I want to tell you in the key of all, thank you guys for having this forum and giving us the opportunity to ask questions. I hear us talk a lot about um, police um, and police violence, um, particularly to um, our community. I'm born and raised right here in Minneapolis. Um, but um, as far as the prosecution initiative census adjust, adjustment goes, um, I want to talk about judges who have been found, um, um, who have been found um, being corrupt and sending people to jail for a long time. My brother Marvin Haynes was exonerated thanks to you. Um, about Marvin's case and also Mike Alvarell's case and many of the other families that my organization is fighting for, they all have the same judge on um, first all and ain't yeah, the same prosecutor um, and judge first all and um, a Chrome Shaw. Sorry, I always get nervous in the time I start talking. Um, and so, is there a way for us to look into the cases? Because we, we now we have two people who had to be let out of jail due to corruption of the judicial system. Is there a way for us to look at those type of cases? Um, and what are the resources from looking at those, and particularly between the years of 2002 to 2007? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah I, I actually started practicing in Hennepin County in 1990. And so those periods of time were when I was actually trying cases. So I'm well aware of the things that I saw from the prosecutors then. So the answer to that question, or part of it, is conviction review or conviction integrity. Um, as you know, uh, the AG's office has a conviction review. But you know, they're not doing it glacially no. slow. Yeah. They're not so, doing it at all. Yeah. So we, we are creating our own. We do get budget resources to do that. So we hope to have that up and running by the end of the year. Um, we did just have a meeting with first firm and members of the AG's office because is right now we don't have that up and running. We also know there are a lot, most of the cases that they have are actually in county cases. And so ultimately we will be reviewing the head of the county cases. Um, yes. But there's like the what happens between now and then. So we did have a very good conversation about better communication on the Hennepin cases and more collaboration there. Um, but I am well aware of the issues um, with prosecution in general in those years. And that is one of the reasons why we're, we're building our own conviction review. Yes. Okay. But the way that this um, prosecution initiative um, census adjustment work, they're not actually looking at extra claims of innocence. Right. And I love right. what you're doing. Yeah. It's going to bring a lot of hope and stuff for a lot of families. But what about the families who was put in prison for crimes that they didn't commit? That's, How that's, what, that's yeah. what the commission okay. is. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. That's specifically for innocence claims. Right. Okay. Which is yes. great. And, and so the, the big difference there, too, and for and something Marvina mentioned, this is something we can all do, too. There will be a bill at the legislature about post conviction. When people uh, want, when they get convicted and they want to go back to court because they may have new evidence where they've exhausted all their appeals. There are really limited time a Huge issue. You have to get into court within a couple of years. If you don't, it's kind of like tough luck. It doesn't matter if you are actually innocent. So what Marina said about her brother's case, when her brother went to court or asked for post-conviction review, we could have said, too bad, you're past the two years, and that would have, and the judge could not have heard it. I agreed to waive that, uh, to allow them to go to court. 
That was you, John. Yeah. Normally, they fight it to the nail, even when there is evidence of innocence. But that shouldn't be left up to the individual prosecutors. That's right. Thank you. And so there will be a bill proposed in the legislature, and you should all be talking to uh, legislators, uh, telling them that you support a bill that changes that timeline. <coughs> Do you know who's carrying that bill? Mary, what? who's carrying that bill? I know that we're Janelle, working. who's carrying that bill? Representative Frazier. Frazier. Frazier, okay. Janelle is our legislative liaison on that <laughs> So we have Paul, and then we have Oh, whoever has the microphone. Hi. Okay. My name is Paul Bossman. I'm an attorney with Communities United Against Police. <laughs> Michelle hired me away from Freeborn County the day after I took a job there as a prosecutor. And I want to encourage you to look on this community as a resource. Um, I'm not bragging because Judge Norm said I had the best investigative team for civil civil rights lawyers. And, you know, there, some of them are in the back door. Yes. Right now. Right. <laughs> I understand the difficulty of taking 1,500 to 2,500 pages of BCA docs and video and audio pictures and digesting that. But if you want the Leaders Digest version of this is a better narrative, that's the stuff to look at. And I'm going to give you an easier question. Um, transparency is something we've talked about a lot. One of the things that we worked on a lot is data practices law. We're currently suing the BCA on behalf of five different families to try and get them to cough up the BCA report. In some cases, 18 months after the, the commission. Families hear the press version of what their well, what happened that day. They hear the county attorney's version, they hear the cops version, but they don't get to see the data. There is a part of 13.82, the, the section of data on law enforcement Third, subdivision 13, which says that the county attorney can provide crime victim data to the victims of crimes. We've tried to use that, and it's worked up in Lake County, but Ramsey County has told us, oh no, uh, we've got the BCA stuff, but sometimes we do our own investigation. We're afraid the family's going to foul up our investigation, and they've refused to give us information for the family, and that's the law they can do that. We'd ask your office to try and make that available to the families. We've spent, when we first started doing this, it was taking 12 to 14 months to get data. It's taking even longer now for the BCA to cough up that data. And your office can short circuit that, give information to families, give ammunition to civil attorneys who can do the research, who can help provide that information to your office. This community has a great deal of power for you. If you can look at that part of the data practice as well, Make it work. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so we have a civil division. Um, a lot of people don't know that. So we have, as I said, we engage in child protection group, child support. We also have an entire civil division. It's a very interesting structure because our civil division represents all of the county departments and the county board, and the county administrator. So our civil division represents the sheriff, for instance. And, you know, I, I spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out how does all that work where my own civil division is defending people in ways that maybe I personally wouldn't do it. And so we, we, the head of our civil division is named Beth Staff. We've had a lot of conversations about that. And essentially, there is a bit of a divide there, it, just in terms of separation. Yeah, it's supposed to be a firewall. They give, not a firewall really for Something. me, but um, I was, they, they give, so I can talk about policy. They don't advise, um, they advise departments on kind of risk management, right? Um, not policy. So they'll say, well, if you do this, they'll say it's illegal, or you could do it, but your liability is this, and just try to lay out the various options, but ultimately the policy part of it is up to the division head. One of the things that I think does get back to your question, 
uh, data practices. Um, some of the interpretations there about what comes under the, what we can't give away. Um, at, we, we are in the process of hiring a data person, by the way, um, because we know we're getting a lot of data requests. But I think it's something we need to think at because historically it's in the, in the county, you know, maybe law for the, nobody's transparent, right? Everybody's afraid of lawsuits and stuff like that. I believe in transparency. I think we do need to look a little bit at the are we not handing over stuff we should be handing over? Are we kind of using data practices as kind of a shield to not hand stuff over? So I, I think it's something we really need to look at. We haven't yet gotten there, um, but that is uh, something we need to look at. Thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you, Mary. Um, when people elected you, they, we elected you for a reason, and that therefore creates a huge amount of expectation on you. And we realize that you know you're at your one year anniversary, of, you know, and so it's like hurry up, hurry up, make all these things happen. And so that's hard, you know. And people have to understand that that you came into an office that was in a great state of disarray and really had very little to no uh, kind of practices and policies in place that needed to be there. Um, had a lot of uh, very disgruntled employees. Um, and people with wrong attitudes and all that stuff. So I want to, you know, want, I want people to recognize that, you know, recognize how hard you work, how much you've worked, but also knowing that what we know about you, we have this great expectation, right, of what's going to happen. And so uh, we want to work with you and support you in that. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that New York, um, the, um, I think they call it the, it's not the corporate council, but what they call the, I can't remember anyway. The the prosecuting office for you know Manhattan um, has created a unit, a separate unit that prosecutes police. And I think the reason that that's important is this: I want to see police. Um, you know, I want to see police do what they're supposed to do, right? That's the first thing everything everybody in the room wants. Um, but I don't want to just see a look at deadly force cases. I think that if you know a police officer beats up a 15 year old kid for no good reason, you know, whatever, you know, engages in excessive force. That's also a crime. If they cause, you know, you know, significant bodily injuries or whatever, that makes it a felony. They ought to be prosecuted as if they committed a felony. Why? Because when you prosecute cops for that kind of conduct, you will actually reduce the number of cops that are killed, I mean, the number of people that are killed by cops. Um, you know, we need to address things, you know, before we get to that point, just like we always talk about nipping crime in the butt at a lower level. We need to be thinking like that with police also. And I recognize that some cops are not going to want to work with people. At the same time, they're cutting their own noses to spite their faces because why? If they're trying to get a prosecution in a case that they worked up and they won't, and, excuse me, they won't work with your people, well, you guys are the ones that do the prosecution, so where are they going to go? Their case will not get prosecuted. Their person, victim that they're working with will not get sat, you know, satisfaction or relief of any kind. So, you know, that's just going to be a price, and, and it'll be an adjustment. But, you know, looking for those people that would be willing, and like I said, they have a special unit just specifically for that, and I think, and they don't understand, you know, um, excessive force, and all the things around police, uh, uh, permissible uses of force, and all those kinds of things, and they develop expertise. I would advise you to consider a, a, a separate, specific unit to prosecute police, and not just for deadly force, but for all the crimes they commit, the corruption. You know, we got a unit of cops up here on the north side that is engaged in some of the most corrupt <coughs> behavior, you know, that I, I think people in this room know what I'm talking about. Outrageous conduct um, of people who've committed no crimes, and nothing's happened to these guys, which is why they keep doing it. So any of that kind of stuff needs to be addressed. Yeah, when you talk about that, um, I think I see really, um, that is a good idea. Um, because, as you said, the people doing that work um, don't have to rely on police or looking at those cases, I should say. Because we do get investigations like that. Mm -hmm. you know, the investigations that we get from the say are not all, and some of them are uh, accusations of sexual assault, <coughs> or physical assault, and right. stuff like that. And it would be ideal to have a separate team that did that. Right now, we don't have those people. Yeah. And so, I, don't that. I think ideally that would be the route that we go. And we have been talking about that, actually. Um, 
because I think you're right that having a team that's separated from the other work would be ideal. Yeah, it has that specialty knowledge. Yes. 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 And that culture of understanding their role. Right. Not a traditional prosecutor. Absolutely. Right. I'll talk to all the department about where you have the money to do that. There's a resource. And I just wanted to add, add to that there, and, and, and we, you know, even though we're looking for accountability, we're always talking about community working together with, you know, law enforcement in relationship-wise. But the community won't do that until they stop seeing those type of things that we're talking about here, uh, standing there watching how other people are, things like that here. I had two, two of them, I'm just going to throw them at you quick. Here, one of them is when we talk about coordinated accountability. I know you you meet with the chiefs here on a regular basis, monthly or whatever it is here. But I wanted to know how, uh, at, from the county's perspective, you could promote a coordinated accountability in the fact that we can't have uh, Minneapolis, Ramsey County, Brooklyn Park, others that have committed to traffic stop policies, creating systems of alternative response programs, but then we have somebody like Brooklyn Center who won't do this thing here, and they're just as guilty out here of profiling and doing things as anybody else is. And this is the thing about it is when we look at different situations, when we see certain uh, stops and, and certain calls and to, to certain situations we see Minneapolis, Brooklyn Center, Crystal, all of them there together. So they're in unison dealing with these things, but if we have, we don't have all of them doing the same things in the process of things, then it makes no sense at, at, at all here that they all should be in a coordinated effort to be able to say, we're, you know, we're not pulling people over for having air freshness in, in their movie mirror or this particular type of thing. And a lot of, and, and then the other thing that, so my question was, I don't know how you can interject into that to make this more of a concerted effort in pulling all those things together. So a uniform yeah, traffic what, stop policy. Yes, the way of saying, because I think from the, the county level it should be something to where we can bring all this together and be able to do this the right way. Here and not have them running off and all of them on one, you know, coming in together on different calls and then going out and willy nilly everybody's doing their own thing here or why like that because it shouldn't be that way here. And a part of that is the other thing I wanted to see is a lot of that starts, the paper trail starts from traffic court, really. I mean, they, they've had a history of, you know, uh, throwing tickets on our people stopping them for anything profiling and then saying, okay, well, our people go to court because they feel that they've been done unjustly here. And then we got these lazy hearing officers and stuff. They, they don't care. They don't want to hear anything from the people. It's like the officer's always right in those particular type of things. And we got to find some way to deal with that because as we saw with the land of still, I mean, that's how they do. They say, well, we'll let those tickets stack up and things. And for a lot of our people, they turn into warrants. People can't always take off from work. People don't have the money. And people got to get to work. And so they'll still drive because they got to get to work to make the money that to try to pay those things off here and everything. And a lot of that is a game because they know that they get those people stuck in those situations. And People, like I said, they go to court and hearing officers just got to hem and haw, sit there, and they get away with it and walk out of there uh, like that. So, uh, gosh, I, I had one more. I do, I do have answers to two yeah. questions, though. Yeah, yeah. So, First, yeah, I'll leave it alone because I, I totally forgot the, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> two things. Uh, yeah. I, I believe there may be some legislation about types of stops that yeah. police can make, that would be statewide. Yeah. Um, but in terms of county, we do have a really big opportunity here, which is called the consent decree. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we, do. we know that uh, Minneapolis has agreed that they 
will not be engaging in certain types of studies. So we know that they're in the process of developing policy and then doing training, and that's taking some time here. But one of the things we introduced to, I've talked to the chiefs about in Hennepin, and I talked about this months ago, it was this. So, well, let me take a step back. So, let's say MPD stops somebody after they've done their training and they have their policy, and they stop somebody for something that they're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. Let's say they find drugs or something, and then they submit that case to our office. Technically, um, they are in violation of the consent decree by engaging in that kind of stuff. But what is the remedy for that? The remedy for that is really hauling them back to court, probably saying you're not supposed to be doing this. But Another remedy could be, and we are in the process of talking to our office and thinking about what is our role as the Hennepin County Attorney with the consent decree. We could legally charge cases that arise from stops that were improper, and I mean improper under the consent decree, not improper under the law. The consent decree doesn't apply to us. In other words, we're not a party to it. Neither is Brooklyn Center, Robbinsdale, whoever. It's for the sheriff, for the state control. And so we are having these conversations, and I, I told the chiefs to start thinking about what are your thoughts about, you know, once the consent decree, consent decrees are in place, what do you think is fair? You know, what do you think our office should be doing? And if Minneapolis cannot stop somebody for whatever, do you think the sheriff or the state patrol should be able to stop somebody in Minneapolis for that same thing? Do you think, uh, just because you're in Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, or someplace just on the other side of Minneapolis, that those police should be able to stop somebody for the same thing that the consent decree bans? And so I said to them, I think you should start talking to your councilmen, your constituents, your, you know, figure out what would be appropriate policy for you. So we're going to start pushing those conversations because we are going to be in a situation where we are going to have to decide what do we do? Are we part of the spirit of enforcement of this? Yeah. And if so, does that only apply to the MPD or does it apply to the sheriff and everybody else. So those are conversations we are uh, about to start having. Um, and those are conversations you should be having in your communities, especially if you're not from, well, if you are from Minneapolis, you should be talking to the sheriff, um, you should be talking to the state patrol, those agencies that operate in Minneapolis. If you're not from Minneapolis, you should be talking to your uh, law enforcement, mayor, city council, electives, about what you want to see in terms of those policies. Now, I do get, and actually when I talk to the chiefs about it, I get pushback on it. People came in and said, are you going to stop us from doing pretext stops or something like that? And I will often talk about the data. Because the data is really critical in pretext stops. And the data is huge. And so what I said to them is, we should be looking at all of your data. Because in MPD, and we were looking at some of this when I was chief PD, we know that there are racial disparities, right? We know there are a ton of racial disparities. Practically everywhere you look in the country, there are going to be racial disparities. But the pushback was always um, stuff like, well, so-and-so has more of this or something like that. And so when I was chief PD, we asked for data from MPD, which allowed us to crush the numbers. We got like a 19,000 line. Excel spreadsheet, we crunched the numbers. It turned out for black drivers who were stopped and searched, they found a gun in less than, was it, half of 1% yeah, of the yeah. time. Okay. And so that's where you really get into, and I've said this to other chiefs, so it's not effective. It's not effective. So if you're going to tell me, because Anecdote from chiefs though is, well, we're getting guns off the street, we're getting drugs off the street, we're really successful. Right, and so what I would say to them is, let's look at your data because if 
you're getting lots of stuff off the street, then you're doing something different than every other chief in the country. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to be looking at that. Right. And the critical piece of the data, too, and, and the data is why Minneapolis will lead to the consent decree. Some of them, we're not going to do these particular things because those things are particularly related to the race data. Mm -hmm. We know that there are particular types of stops. And, and I'm not saying it's intentional, it could be intentional, not intentional, or whatever it is, we know that there are particular stops that are made um, based on uh, race mm -hmm. because there's a bias, unconscious or otherwise, that they will find something. But when you look at the actual data, they don't. And, you know, I also say to cheese, so, because I have one of them say, well, I think if you're getting a gun, then less than half of one percent of the people, that's one gun off the street. And I said, well, look at it this way. 99% of those cases, you have a black driver who is pulled over and searched. And I can imagine what that looks like or feels like in this day and age. Inconvenience, traumatized, whatever, for nothing. If you are really about building relationships in the community, um, that's not the way to do it. So arguing that it isn't effective is really critical. So I think pushing our suburb, everybody on their data, is going to be really important because I think it's easier for people to say, oh, we're getting this off the street, we're getting that off the street, and we need to look at the data. So county-wide, that is a conversation we are about to get more serious about as we get closer to the consent. Yeah, because we can't depend on the city councils and stuff. I mean, I mean, in reality, the city council doesn't want to look like they're anti-police. They want to look like they're back in the blue, you know, and so they're, they're going to go where the unions and them say go, and it does nothing for the citizens. We're going to take one, one more question. Uh, yeah, I'm Emma. Uh, I'm with the reinvestigation of the group. Um, it's me and my, my family back there that do the reinvestigations. Um, and we do have an attorney. Oh. Um, but anyway, I just want to first thank you, Kiana, Mary, um, and Michelle as well for putting together this wonderful event. I think it was really beautiful um, and really informative. So thank you for your time, everybody. Um, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I want to bring back to please deadly force just a little bit more. Um, you know, one of the things that we and my family do is we look at every aspect like you're saying. We look at whether or not we can prove it beyond reasonable doubt. We also look at the use of deadly force law. I actually wrote my master's thesis on the change to the deadly force law in 2020, and there's some very important changes that I'm sure you're aware of um, that I think should be noted um, in how we look at deadly force. So my question to you is one of the things that we do is for every case, we, we looked at a lot of them when we were 20 at this point, we write a report. And I want to know how useful is that report to you, what elements should be in a report that you and your office would take seriously and that would be useful to you. One of the things that we have done is we hired expert witnesses. We've hired police use of force um, experts um, that we use typically in civil cases, but it may be um, We've also hired forensic pathologists. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us specifically what would be of use to you from us? Well, as I, when I've met with people, um, and I, Michelle, you know, as I said, you know, give me everything you have, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, in terms of, um, sometimes what I hear from families is, well, not everything is in here, or something is missing from the report, or there's something that we want you to be aware of. And I'm not, you know, anything that you think we, you want us to know uh, should be in there, and we will take a look at it. Um, and so, I mean, sometimes I think I've heard people say, well, there's a video that's missing, there's a, something that went wrong with the video. So pointing out things that, that you see are important, um, because I, you know, people miss stuff. So, in terms of experts, um, we have certainly relationships with some experts. Um, we look for certain things in experts. Um, and so, depending on the case, 
And so we have those relationships and we can figure that out. Um, but in terms of investigation, as I said, I'll you know, give you what you got. Um, we'll take a look at it. If you think there's something important, uh, put it in there. You think there's something we might miss, put it in there. If you think something is really obvious that you want us to take note of, put it in there. So would you rather us just give you the data or actually spend the time writing the report? Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by data. We would get uh, an investigation from probably the PCA. And so is there, sometimes you might go out and you might interview other witnesses that maybe they didn't interview. We would want to see those. Um, and I, I don't know what you mean by data, but... Yeah, like the BCA investigative data, like all of the, the files, you know, transcripts, yeah, we, interviews, stuff. We get that um, from them, so we should have all of that. But if there's something you think we didn't get, then that should definitely be there. I think to the extent that you can supply that additional context and information, yeah. that is very helpful. Because the frame and the lens that you are coming from is countercultural to what the county attorney's office and other departments are typically doing in these cases. Well, and you have a, a different lens um, than law enforcement, and so there could be something completely maybe innocent that the BCA overlooked or just didn't think about. Or not. <laughs> 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 and just one, one final note too. I was thinking about the resource problem you're talking about with these cases. Um, I'm going to be going to law school in the fall, and one of the things that I would love is an opportunity to to work in the prosecutor's office on these specific cases. So that's maybe a resource that you can tap into, maybe, you know, two or three hours. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not a hand. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. So, if you guys enjoy this experience. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yes. 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 Yes what's next as far as our push for justice. Because you guys can see, like, there is still so much work to be done. And simply because there are two consent decrees does not mean that the work is over. It's far from over. We have a real opportunity here. I want to thank Pete Gamarez and um, Kimberly Milliard from the Racial Justice Network for helping to organize yeah. our community. And my job is I'm thankful to Michelle Gross and CUAPB. I'm thankful to Mary Moriarty. Yes. And the county attorney's office, as well as the staff. Yes. And so we're here today. And the staff out there is an opportunity for us to engage. Thank you to King Demetrius. Woo! Listen! And again, thank you all for being here. Would you guys like to do this again in the future? Yes. Okay, so we will be here to bring out our uh, I just appreciate you all coming out. I, you know, I, I talked about this before that um, the system, the criminal legal system, has always been made much more mysterious than it should be. Um, and I think that was designed to keep people from asking the hard questions about is this working? And so one of my goals is to make it um, as accessible to everyone, to community as possible. Because we all need you to be part of this. We need you to be speaking out about what you want because this is your system. So thank you for showing up. Um, and <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, thank you for showing up. And I will be back at some point. Um, looking forward to the next conversation about how, you know, we're just rolling out a piece of next week. Um, and as I said, we had our first felony murder case this morning, and mm. eviction review is yet to come. So we have a lot of great things on the horizon, and I yes. love to talk about the things that we're doing and hear what you guys have to say. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. We just, we all want you to know, you have an army of constituents out here that got you. Just so we clear. <laughs> <laughs>
That's right. We Thank got you, you guys. Please take sandwiches that are left over the water. Thank you. Have a good night. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKinley. I saw the time that you were like, I was like, we were we were we were we were we were Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Listen Media USA. Thank you for listening to what we have to say. Here's what's happening in your neck of the hood.